Everyone who's been bitten by the reading bug has had that experience of being so swept away by a book that we lose track of time and the world around us. It's a wonderful experience. And one of the biggest questions for us as authors is, how do we achieve that consistently for our readers? How do we get them to that place of deep enjoyment and vivid engagement and imagination as they vicariously invest themselves into the story that we've worked so hard to create for them? Well, if you've ever tried to write anything for yourself, then you know that the answer to that question is long and complex and multifaceted and involves a lot of different factors. But one of the biggest is writing vivid and engaging descriptions. Now, descriptions are kind of the unsung hero of good fiction writing. They're not as flashy as a great, memorable, fun character or a really gripping and pulse-pounding plot. But even the greatest characters or the most exciting plots will kind of fall flat if they're played out in a blank or boring, under-described space, or if they're drowned out by laundry lists of descriptive detail that distract the reader and don't really serve the story. Great descriptive writing is the portal through which readers engage themselves into the world of the story, whatever genre it happens to be in. You have to have incredible descriptive writing to ground your reader in the scenes that the story is taking place in and allow them to fully invest their imagination into it. So in this video, we are going to explore everything that I can share with you about how to write powerful, vivid, engaging descriptions. And I think some of the practical tips that I'm going to share are going to really help you up your game in your descriptive writing, even in just a few minutes. So I think the best place to start is by busting a bit of a myth or misconception about the role of description in your writing. It would seem obvious that the purpose of description is to show the reader what things look like, because we're translating just blank, flat words on a page into images and scenes and sounds and smells and feelings and all these different, like, that translation process is what description is meant to do, because otherwise the reader has no context to know what things look like or what is really going on around the characters as they're doing their various things. And that's true to an extent, like that's the functional purpose of descriptive writing. But I think a far more important purpose of description in your writing is to engage emotion and feeling for the reader. And this is one of the most important things to keep in mind when you're approaching your descriptions. If you shift your focus away from just showing what things look like and instead showing where and how your reader can begin to feel things about what's happening in the scene, you'll end up already in a much better place than, frankly, a lot of writers, including myself for a long time, because that's how I thought of descriptions for a good long while, and it's why my descriptions were kind of flat and boring. Anything that you want to describe, whether it's a tree, or the ocean, or a building, or the way a character looks, all of the details of how something looks are kind of generic and irrelevant when they're removed from the context of the perspective of the person who is looking at them. There's two primary ways to work at this, and the first and probably easiest of the two is to filter your descriptions through the perspective and opinions and feelings of your characters. As an example, let's take a small town main street somewhere in America. You could spend a lot of time describing what this quaint small town street looks like the buildings and the trees and the whatever. And that would be fine. Like you could paint a nice picture, but that same description would be so much stronger and more engaging if it was presented, let's say, through the point of view of a war veteran who was returning back home to his hometown after years abroad. Now, all of a sudden, your character has responses, reactions, and feelings to the things that he is seeing, which you are describing, but also he is then reacting to. And maybe walking down the street of his hometown, now that he's been out and seen the wider world and he's been through some stuff, will help him begin to realize how much he has changed because the things that he remembered a certain way, he's now seeing in a different light. Maybe things look smaller, or maybe it's the refreshing return to some normalcy that he's desperately needed. There's so many different ways that you could take that, and the choices that you make along those lines will determine a lot of how the scene feels, and therefore where your characters can sort of empathetically engage 
with the description. It becomes so much more impactful and meaningful to hear about the general store, not just as a building, but as a marker or a reminder or a trigger or some kind of a response or reaction that the character has as they are in the scene. This is a technique that you can pr almost always use, even if you're technically in third person omniscient, which is not a point of view that is written in very often, but even there you still have a narrator who very often has a perspective and a style and a bias that can filter through in some of those descriptions. But most of the time, you're either writing in first or third person, which means you're writing through the perspective of a character. So thinking about how your character feels about what they are seeing, even if it's subtle, is a really powerful way to make your description immediately more engaging for your reader. But the second really effective way to engage feeling and emotion in your description is by focusing on creating space for your reader to have associations, memories, feelings, and responses to your descriptions themselves, not just through the perspective of your character, but their own associations with what is being described on the page. The primary way that you work at this is by always remembering that you are writing in collaboration with your reader rather than trying to force your reader to see things a particular way. It's sort of a natural default to think, well, this is how I envision this scene. This is what the room looks like to me, or this is what the cliffside they're on looks like to me. And then to think that you need to use your description to try to get every single reader to have that same picture. I would argue that is the wrong way to go about writing your description. Does it really matter if readers know that the drapes in the room are red instead of blue? Does it really matter if they know exactly how tall or short a character is or exactly how long their hair is? Certain things, yes, but trying too hard to achieve a photographic translation of the image in your head for all of your readers requires you to describe in such exhaustive detail that you're actually um, undercutting the, uh, the story itself and the flow and pace and movement of the scene. On the other hand, if you're too worried about over-describing and you're not confident enough in the descriptions that you are attempting, it's easy to also under-describe, which leads to what I call white room syndrome, where you sketch out the very most bare-bones details of a scene, but you do it in fairly short, cryptic, or generic terms, which leaves a sort of mushy, vague, blurry concept of a location, or a scene, or a setting, or whatever is going on. Like, it's a little bit there, but it's not vivid, or specific, or engaging, because you haven't done enough in your actual descriptions to get your reader to that point. You want to aim for sort of the Goldilocks zone. Not too much, not too little. And the best way that I've found to do that is by intentionally selecting what I call sensory anchor points to build your description around. When you're working at describing a scene, think of the five primary senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, and intentionally select a few, not too many, maybe two or three, very specific and vivid and interesting, well-defined sensory details for the scene that you want to lay out. Not every possible thing you could show, but just a few. What happens when you do that is that you give your reader a few points of vivid detail that really pop and that allow them to kind of use them as, like I said, anchor points for what the scene overall or the setting or the location, whatever it is you're describing, a character, might look or feel like. But you're also leaving enough room in between those anchor points that the reader's mind subconsciously often, without even realizing it, is going to paint in a lot of the undefined detail in and around those very vivid details and the great part about that is that the details their mind provides will be the most interesting and the most emotionally relevant and evocative details for them. So yes, you end up with scenes that look kind of different to different readers, but that's actually a really good thing because it means that each reader is inhabiting the scene that is the most engaging for them. Good authors do this a lot without maybe us often even realizing what's going on. And the reason I know that is because anytime you see a translation or an adaptation of a popular book into film or television, there is always an associated conversation that I have seen play out in forums or comment sections 
where people are talking about how weird it is to see a character or a location kind of codified as the one way that it now looks because it is played by an actor or it's done in, you know, on set or in CGI. And that's what it looks now. And very often it looks different than they had thought, but it looks different in different ways for different readers, because while it was still in the form of a book, everybody has the space to fill in around the specific details that the author was clear about with some of the material from your own psyche and memory and emotions and experiences that are most engaging to you and you end up with a scene that has color and nuance that appeals most to you personally as the reader. So the next time you're working on a description, whether it's for a character or a place or whatever it else that it might be, spend some time and actually start making a list on the side of which sensory anchors you might use and then choose two or three of the best ones. So rather than just saying, it was sunny out as your character is walking through a meadow to go um, somewhere else. Maybe you might describe the way the sunlight glints off the water of the stream that they're walking beside like gemstones sparkling in the bed of the river. And that might create a certain kind of emotional resonance. Maybe you might talk about how that makes your character feel or how they respond to it. But also that's a very vivid detail that your reader can connect to and have feelings about themselves. Maybe you might describe the way that that character can smell the scent of rain and the tingle of electricity in the air because they know that a storm is rolling in and they're trying to get to the house that they're walking to in time before the storm hits. Well, again, that's a very vivid sensory detail that most of us have an enough of association with that we can kind of place ourselves in that because we know what that feels like. We've experienced it ourselves. And again, your character might have thoughts or feelings or responses to that, and your reader will have thoughts and feelings and responses to that. By triangulating your description around two or three of those kinds of vivid details that you describe well and clearly, you create a much more dynamic and engaging scene for your reader to kind of vicariously invest themselves in. And by building description after description after description that way throughout the course of a whole story, that is one of the best ways that I have found as a writer to allow your reader to become swept away and fully enmeshed and spellbound in the world that you are building, regardless of what genre it is, whether it's literary fiction or romance or a thriller, you're building a, an imagined world, an imagined play space for your reader's imagination to come and get invested into. So focusing on really effective and engaging descriptions will allow your reader to do that faster and more consistently and then to stay in that space for longer and that, again, is one of the best ways to write stories that people are blown away by, remember for years to come, and want to talk about and share with friends and family because of the experience you just provided for them. Now, there's an awful lot more I could say and have said about writing detailed descriptions because I filmed a whole Skillshare class on this. There's a lot of detail to get into, which would make this video a lot longer than it needs to be. But I put the link in the description for you to check that out if you would like to get more in depth and go under the hood, so to speak, of really learning how to write effective, engaging descriptions, then check that link. If you're already on Skillshare, you can watch the whole class there for free. And if not, then the link will give you the option of getting an entire month free on Skillshare, um, which would be more than enough time to make it through not only that course, but all the other courses that I've made on that platform. So give that a look. And until next time, I wish you all the best in your writing to come.